This is a recording of material that was covered in February 25 lecture in Design 2, MEE 381. Before we begin our discussion, I just want to talk about the variables that we'd be using for this lecture. The first is our safety factor, N. Then we also have four strengths, um, our ultimate compressive strength, ultimate tensile strength, our yield strength and tension, as well as our yield strength and shear. One thing I want to say about these strengths is that we don't have anything here that says our yield strength in compression, SYC, and uh, typically speaking, and we can also call this SYT, or yield strength and tension, typically speaking for even materials, these will be equal, so sometimes they'll just be called SY. Um, then we also want to discuss our principal stresses, we'll be talking about that, as well as our von Mises effective stress. Our discussion today will be on static failure theories for ductile materials. And in this, we're going to look at three different theories. The first is the maximum normal stress theory. The second is the maximum shear stress theory. And the third and final one will be the distortion energy theory. Our first theory that we'll examine is the maximum normal stress theory. This is when um, our normal stress reaches some limit of our normal strength. You'll notice that on our graph that we have here, we have our principal stress 1 and principal stress 3. Uh, we're going to assume plane stress with sigma 2, our principal stress 2, equals 0. Our theory states that when our normal stresses um, reach a limit beyond our yield strength, then uh, we have failure. So everything on the inside is considered safe for our maximum normal stress. Realize that this ratio of stress divided by our strength is the opposite of our factor of safety, where our factor of safety is n is equal to our yield strength, or our failure strength, whatever that may be, divided by our applied stress, or our principal stress. So let's look at an example using the maximum normal stress theory. Here we have a stress element with a 70 KSI tensile stress in one direction and a 60 KSI compressive stress in our other direction. Notice that we have no shear stresses, so that indicates that we have a principal stress state. Our specimen has a yield strength both in tension and compression. We have an even material of 100 KSI. And then we also have a yield strength in shear of 50 KSI. We'll talk about this a little bit later. So let's just look at our normal strength uh, situation. So if we want to look at our factor of safety um, in our principal stress direction one, we'll call this principle one, principle three. Our factor of safety is our yield strength, 100 KSI, divided by our applied or our principal stress, 70 KSI. And what we have is a factor of safety of 1.43. If we look at our principal stress 3, again, we have a yield stress of 100 KSI. And we have a compressive stress of minus 60 KSI. Here we have a factor of safety of 1.67. Of course, when we're looking at this, we're talking about our magnitudes. Now let's look at um, our ratio of our principal stress, sigma 1, to our yield stress, sigma y. And here we have a 70 KSI divided by 100 KSI. Of course, that's a ratio of 0.7. And we'll do the same thing for our principal stress 3. Here we have a minus 60 KSI over 100 KSI. And our ratio here is a minus 0 0.6. And what we'll do is we'll look at our graph that we had and see how that holds up. So here we have our graph, which shows our stress 
ratios. And recall that N1, our factor of safety in the first direction, is, is 1.43. That ends up being 1. Point, um, I'm sorry, 0.7 on our graph, which is somewhere in this area. And then we have N3, which is our factor of safety of uh, principal direction 3, and that ends up being negative 0.6 on our graph. And so that's right in this area right here. So it looks like we are safe. Our factors of safety say that we're safe. And we are inside our so-called safe region, where our white region is unsafe. But are we indeed safe? Well, the problem with the maximum normal stress theory, it doesn't take into account our maximum shear stress, where our maximum shear stress is sigma 1 minus sigma 3, um, all divided by 2. So let's calculate our maximum shear stress. We have a 70 KSI is sigma 1 minus sigma 3, which is a negative 60 KSI. All that divided by 2, and we have a maximum shear stress of 65 KSI. However, our shear, our shear strength is only 50 KSI, so we have a problem. And what that problem is, is that the maximum normal stress theory is unsafe, do not use. And it's unsafe in these regions right here. And that's where we have, basically we have distortion. Here in uh, the positive sigma 3 area and positive sigma 1 area, we have tension in both directions and we have less distortion. Same thing in this area, right down in this regime, we have uh, compression in both directions and so we are safer but in the second and the fourth quadrants we have tension and compression which causes um, our material to become unsafe so the next theory that we're going to look at is our maximum shear stress theory and this theory states that our yield strength in shear is equal to one half of our yield strength in tension and we can see um, how this envelope uh, shows that. It takes care of the problem that we had before um, with um, this portion being unsafe. The factor of safety for our maximum shear stress theory is as follows, that our uh, um, yield strength uh, divided by our principal strength 1 minus principal stress 3 is our factor of safety. In summary, our maximum shear stress theory solves our problem with our distortions from uh, our tension and compression regimes, but it's actually been found to be too conservative. Um, data shows that our materials fail, our ductile materials fail um, in this region as well, which is slightly outside of our maximum shear stress or shear strength regime. So we notice that we have more of a, uh, an oval shape that seems to contain all of our failures for our different materials. So this oval shape is what we call our distortion energy theory. Everything that's beyond our oval, any kind of principal stresses between, this is again in plane stress, uh, outside of our oval it would be in failure and anything that would be contained within is safe. Now let's compare this theory um, envelope to our other uh, theories. If we compare it to our normal stress theory, we again see that we had our problem that we had in our first example where we had failure that was occurring in this regime, um, but notice that our distortion energy theory contains, uh, would, have, would have told us that would have been a failure. Now, if we compare it to our maximum shear stress theory, we see that this uh, gray region is our shear stress theory, and we can see that it is um, still safe, but um, it's more conservative than our um, distortion energy theory. Uh, and um, However, the distortion energy theory is still considered safe, and so that is what we will be looking at next. So we'll introduce von Mises' effective stress. The von Mises effect of stress basically represents a uniaxial tensile stress that would create the same distortion energy as the combination of applied stresses. So the von Mises effect of stress is what we would use for our distortion energy theory. 
and these equations come from Norton, our text. Um, and there's basically four equations. Um, all of them are using what's called the von Mises. We're all solving for the von Mises effective stress. And notice that we have sigma prime for our, our von Mises effective stress. In three dimensions, according to our principal stresses, sigma 1, 2, and 3, we have equation 5.7a. If we want to um, show von Mises effective stress in terms of our applied stresses, sigma x, sigma y, sigma z, uh, as well as tau xy, tau xy, uh, yz, and tau zx, we would use 5.7b. Uh, for plane stress, where we're showing that sigma 2, our principal stress, is equal to 0, um, then basically 5.7a reduces to what we have here is 5.7c. And then finally, uh, according to plane stress, once again, where in this case we have uh, our stress on a z face is equal to zero, then 5.7b um, reduces down to 5.7d, where we have our von Mises stress in terms of sigma x, sigma y, and tau xy. Two last things with von Mises effective stress. The first is our factor of safety, where we have n is equal to our yield strength divided by our von Mises effective stress. The second thing is our shear strength, where we have our shear strength is equal to 0.577 times our yield strength. If you want to compare that from our maximum shear stress theory, we see that from that theory we have 0.55, I'm sorry, 0.5 of our yield strength. And so our vimesis effective stress or distortion energy theory gives us a less conservative shear strength. So let's do an example comparing our different failure theories. If we have a element with a principal stress of sigma 1 is equal to 20 ksi, it has a sigma 2 equal to 0 ksi, and sigma 3 is equal to minus 25 ksi, it is in plain stress, we can um, also say that the yield strength, or we have that the yield strength is equal to 60 ksi. What we want to know is find the factor of safety using the maximum normal stress theory, maximum shear stress theory, and the distortion energy theory, also known as von Mises. So our maximum normal stress theory states that our factor of safety n is equal to our yield strength divided by our maximum normal stress. Well, in this case, we have two potential normal stresses. We have our sigma 1 and we have sigma 3. Um, and of course, we want the maximum of these two. So our yield strength was 60 ksi. And our maximum normal stress was sigma 3, which as ended up being minus 25 ksi. So we'll take the absolute value of that. And we have a factor of safety of 2.4. It appears to be quite safe using this theory, but again, we find that this theory is insufficient uh, and not very helpful for failure theories. So now, that, now let's look at our maximum shear stress theory. Here we have a factor of safety n is equal to our yield strength and shear divided by our maximum shear stress. Well, our yield strength and shear is equal to our yield strength divided by 2. And our maximum shear stress is equal to sigma 1 minus sigma 3. And that's all divided by 2. Notice that our 2s will cancel out. And so we'll have our yield strength. 60 ksi divided by our principal stresses, which is 20 ksi minus a minus 25 ksi. And that will give us a factor of safety n is equal to 1.3. Our final theory will be the distortion energy theory. And this is where we have a factor of safety n is equal to our yield strength divided by von Mises effective stress. And 
we'll use our equation where we have our principal stresses in two dimensions, where we have the square root of sigma 1 squared minus sigma 1 times sigma 3 plus sigma 3 squared. And here we have 60 KSI all over, and of course we'll have KSI here at the end. I won't write them all the way through. Kind of messy. So we have 20 squared minus 20 times a negative 25 plus 25 squared. Just made it. And here we have a factor of safety of 1.5. So in conclusion, our maximum normal stress theory, we ended up having a factor of safety of 2.4. For our maximum shear stress theory, we had a factor of safety of 1.3. And then for volumesis, we have a factor of safety of 1.5. Again, we see that our maximum shear stress theory is the most conservative, um, but it seems that the volumesis from data, material data, is that volumesis would be the most accurate. Okay, so now let's look at materials that are brittle under static loading. Basically, brittle materials fracture instead of yield. If we look at the stress strain curve of a brittle material, we'll see that the, let me put my laser pointer, we'll see that the material will fall along this curve and then shortly after yield, we get fracture. When we compare this with a ductile material, so this is ductile, notice that the uh, ductile material has a large strain, a large deformation, and then it fails right at this point. So that's our difference between a brittle and a ductile material. Here we see a ductile cast iron, I'm sorry, a brittle cast iron uh, material during tension, and we can see that we've got a clean break here because our uh, specimen under tension, a brittle material under tension, fails from our normal stress. Now let's look at a compression test between a ductile material and a brittle material. Notice that our ductile material under compression deforms uh, greatly. We have significant yielding. However, with our brittle material, we have pretty much shear failure that's occurring here on this 45 degree shear plane. So let's look at even and uneven materials. Even materials have sim similar properties in tension and compression. So our ultimate compressive strength and our ultimate tensile strength are equal. And this is uh, an example, example would be tool steels. Uneven materials typically have strengths greater in compression than in tension. A couple examples would be cast iron, where it has a ultimate compressive strength that's three to four times that of its tensile strength. Uh, with ceramics, we even have a greater, uh, four times um, greater strength in compression than we have in tension.